Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will return to our world of dragons to take a look at our second group of flying dragons, Amphipteres. These are often described as creatures resembling snakes with wings and little elves, and is another of those soft, informal classifications for dragons. The term itself has very limited use in heraldry, but it still fits the descriptions and depictions of lots of dragons and dragon-like creatures in myths and legends, meaning there was a very interesting pool of dragons to pull from for this one. So let's go and see what they could be like as real living beings. Now, if you haven't watched the rest of this ongoing series, I'd recommend you see it to get better context on what we will be seeing today. And also, here's a thank you to our patrons and channel members for their support. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Quite contrasting with the group of flying dragons we explored in our files previously, today we will meet a clade that has evolved into quite a different, much more specialized form from the ancestral flying dragons. The creatures known as Amphipteres diverged from other basal Dracomorpha not long before the development of the mighty weapons of Order Eudraconidae. These dragons, belonging to Order Dracovipera, are characterized by an extreme reduction of the hind limbs and strengthening of the fore limbs, sacrificing the ground mobility of other dragons from superorder Dracomorpha in favor of extremely energetically efficient flight. The reduced posterior limbs, which many times do not even present claws or fingers anymore, have little function beyond acting as extra support for the extended wings of these dragons, also being claspers during mating. Amphipteres are a mainly European and West Asian clade, with species ranging from Spain to the westernmost part of Russia, and from the Scandinavian peninsula to Turkey and Armenia, inhabiting environments as diverse as volcanic areas, mountains, plains and forests. While some species, such as the Spanish Quelebre, present migratory habits, most species have quite restricted distributions despite their ability to fly, and the reason why is perfectly demonstrated by today's research subject, Heliopterra orens, the dragon of Helios. While the body plan of these dragons is incredibly efficient for flight, it is specialized, perhaps over-specialized, on a particular aspect of flight. Rather than being able to fly for long distances, the Amphipteres have adapted to flying extremely high catching the wind and updrafts with their expanded wings and floating up to incredible heights, from which they hunt, far away from the eyes of other, bigger flying dragons. They will stay in the air, barely moving and using their tail vane to adjust their position, and taking advantage of their incredible sight to spot prey moving below on the ground. The Helios dragon will then fold its wings and dive at great speeds, until it has almost hit the ground, or, rather, its prey. It will then open its wings to stop their dive at the last moment and bite their prey with a quick movement, allowing their extremely potent venom to kill their prey in a matter of seconds. This venom, in contrast with that of wyverns, is mostly composed of neurotoxins rather than hemotoxins, allowing it to kill prey faster rather than predigesting it upon being bitten. Then, the amphipteer will rip it apart using its powerful arms and feed at its leisure. Thanks to the potency of their venom, these dragons are quite generalist hunters, and will prey on pretty much any animal smaller or equal in size to them that they can spot with some species accustomed to human presence, even attacking animals as big as cows and horses. Usually, and in contrast with wyverns, 
Amphipters will need to rest for a few days after a meal, digesting their food and being unable to fly until they have done so. On land, Amphipters may seem quite ungainly compared to how majestic they seem in flight, but they are still capable of moving quite fast. Amphipters walk exclusively under extremely powerful arms, strong enough to lift them into the air, while balancing themselves with their tail. However, recently fed Amphipters are much heavier and, in extreme cases, might be seen crawling rather than walking. To protect themselves from other dangerous predators during this very vulnerable period, Amphipters will hide in the tunnels and caves they inhabit, and which they enter easily thanks to their narrow bodies. Still, one of these dragons caught before reaching its home may be forced to defend itself. While the forelimbs of Amphipters are incredibly strong, these dragons are not the best fighters even on a good day and will depend on trying to look scary to drive away other creatures, by extending their enormous wings to look bigger. Some species even have facial and wing markings that accentuate this effect in an attempt to make the potential danger escape. While not adapted to being used as weapons, their strong arms and sharp claws can make good weapons in a desperate situation. Some species, in fact, have almost completely abandoned flight in favor of developing much stronger limbs, therefore adapting to a digging lifestyle and requiring a different way of feeding themselves, like the Scandinavian Nidhogg. These dragons inhabit a wide variety of environments. For instance, the Helios dragon lives in the mountainous regions of Greece where its tan golden scales and spot patterns help it camouflage against the rock. This camouflage is common to most amphipters. Species that live near volcanoes or rocky areas, like the Middle Eastern V-Shap, tend to have greyish colorations, while forest-dwelling species will have a green and tan covering, with very few species deviating from this pattern. Some, however, will have a coloration entirely dedicated to intimidation, like the Russian Verechelen and its bright red coat. This bright coloration works great for scaring away other predators, but is also great for mating displays. Most species of Amphiptyr are adorned with attractive patterns or structures, such as the large horns of the Mediterranean Basmu which are useful for attracting females and for fighting off competitors. The Helios dragon, in contrast, is monogamous and stays with the same couple for life, and so lacks sexual dimorphism or special signals that would be required to attract as many mates as possible. Helios dragon couples can often be seen flying and hunting together as a way to strengthen their bonds shining together in the sunlight like the sun itself, a beautiful sight that resulted in ancient humans naming them after their sun god. These dragons will care for their young together, but most Amphiptyr species will have either parent care for them alone, with some even leaving their eggs in a safe place and letting the hatchlings fend for themselves. As with many other types of dragon, and of animals in general, Many species of Amphiptyr have clashed with humanity due to their tendency to hunt domestic animals. However, the hunting method of these animals makes them hard to predict or hunt, causing them to only be scared of once their lethal venom has been administered, giving extermination programs limited success at best. Instead, Many governmental programs have chosen to provide free and extensive metal mesh roofing to farmers in order to protect their animals, as well as the farmers themselves. This measure will stop the dive of an amphibian without harming it, allowing it to keep living and functioning as part of the environment. And that's it for Speculative Biology Look into Amphiptyrs. 
As mentioned in the intro, and as with most dragon classifications out there, there are no solid truths or real lines to separate which specific mythical dragons fall in which category. Since the people telling these stories were not trying to think of the dragons in terms of how they feed the world around them. Still, trying to see which dragons fit which category has easily been one of the most fun parts of this project, as well as trying to establish exactly what characteristics and adaptations define each clade and how they relate to each other. In the case of Amphiptyrs, the idea of dragons that have pretty much done away with any form of limbs, except for their wings, made for a challenge, but a very fun one to solve, and I think it ended up creating a really interesting and unique clade of dragons. As for the reason why I used the dragon of Helios, the unnamed winged serpents that are sometimes depicted as pulling the chariot of Helios or of his granddaughter, it was mostly done for two reasons. One, I really wanted to work at least one Greek mythological creature into this series, since back when I was a child, Greek mythology had such an integral role in my future interest in all things mythical and fictional. And second, I figured it would be really fun to draw them, with their golden scales and patterns that remind me of some of my favorite animals. I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode and are ready for the next clade of the Dracomorpha. Oh yes, you know which ones are coming up. Those classic fire-breathing dragons are finally making their appearance in our world of dragons. I hope you are excited for what's to come. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.